I'm Elizabeth Esty, and this is the COVID Weekly, brought to you by the Emergency Medical Minute, recording on March 24th. Twelve days after the World Health Organization declared the epidemic of COVID-19 a pandemic. Globally, we've seen a total number of cases of 417,000, with 18,612 deaths. As most of you know, the epidemic began in late December in Wuhan, a province of China. China, to date, has seen 67,000 cases and 3,160 deaths. Notably, tomorrow, the province of Hubei will lift the lockdown that its citizens have experienced for nearly two months. Italy, particularly hard hit by this virus, reported its first case of COVID-19 on January 30th. As of the 22nd, two days ago, the total number of deaths attributed to COVID in Italy surpassed that of China. Italy saw two days of declining death rates, but then yesterday had 743 deaths attributed to COVID, bringing Italy's total number of deaths to 6,820. Washington state reported its first case on January 20th. That's 10 days before Italy's in a 35-year-old healthy man returning from Wuhan to Washington State. To date, Washington State has had 2,328 cases reported and 116 total deaths. New York State had its first confirmed case only 23 days ago on the 1st of March. In the intervening three weeks, New York State now has 25,681 cases and 210 deaths. Today, Governor Andrew Cuomo stated that the total number of confirmed cases in New York seems to be doubling about every three days. It is, of course, important to note that testing in the United States has lagged far behind many other countries, and really the total number of cases in the United States is unknown. Colorado now has seen 912 cases with 84 patients hospitalized in 35 counties in our state and 11 deaths. We have reported in Colorado seven outbreaks at residential and non-hospital health care facilities. In the United States, we have 53,000 some cases, making making the United States the third in the world behind China and Italy. The U.S. to date has reported 706 COVID-19 deaths and 348 people who have recovered from the illness. I would urge you all to look online at the Center for Systems Science and Engineering report given out by Hopkins and updated every day. We're going to look at a couple of studies that have been in the news. A study that has been garnering a lot of attention, including from our president, comes out of France to us. This is an open-label study of hydration hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin as a treatment in COVID-19. On Saturday, President Trump tweeted, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin taken together have a real chance to be one of the biggest game changers in the history of medicine. The FDA has moved mountains. Thank you. Hopefully they will both be put in use immediately. People are dying. Move fast and God bless everyone. The study to which President Trump is referring is out of Marseille and was published on the 17th of March. This is a small study that builds on work done in China. Chinese and French researchers and really researchers across the globe are interested in repurposing old drugs for use in antiviral treatment for obvious reasons. A recent paper reported on the inhibitor effect of remdesivir and chloroquine on the growth of SARS-CoV-2 in vitro. And early clinical trials in COVID-19 Chinese patients confirmed that chloroquine had a significant clinical effect both in patient outcomes and in viral clearance compared to controls. In fact, Chinese experts recommend that patients die diagnosed with mild, moderate, and severe cases of COVID pneumonia and without contraindications to chloroquine be treated with 500 milligrams of chloroquine twice a day for 10 days. In fact, hydroxychloroquine has a better clinical safety profile, hence the use of hydroxychloroquine in the Marseille study. The French authors point out that viral shedding in COVID patients persists for on average 20 days. And in fact, one patient had 37 days of viral shedding. So their hope was to improve patient outcomes, but also to reduce that window of viral shedding. I want to emphasize that this study out of Marseille was very small, not randomized, open label. They began with 36 patients, 26 of whom were to receive the hydroxychloroquine, and 16 were controls from other hospitals. Six patients, though, in that 26-patient treatment group were lost due to early cessation of treatment for various reasons, transferred to ICU or different facilities being the most common. So at the end, 
of the day, 20 patients received hydroxychloroquine and there were 16 controls. The primary outcome measured in this study was absence of virus, presence or absence of virus, six days post-inclusion. The authors found that hydroxychloroquine treatment was, in fact, highly efficient in clearing viral nasopharyngeal carriage of the virus in only three to six days in most patients. Of particular note, the six patients in this study who received azithromycin in addition to their hydroxychloroquine, all six had complete virological cure defined as a negative nasopharyngeal PCR by day six. Clinicians are reminded that concurrent use of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin is associated with increased risk of QT, prolongation, and arrhythmia, and real caution should be used here. Listeners who are not clinicians are strongly advised not to use these medications to prevent or self-treat symptoms. Please consult your physician if you believe you have COVID-19. To put the Marseille study into context, I came across a review of the ongoing research from, I believe it was the University of Paris preprint. This is not peer-reviewed. It's just a survey of all the new medical research surrounding COVID right now. There are, of course, a number of antiviral agents that are being evaluated or have been evaluated for coronaviruses, even though at this recording there are no approved drugs available. This survey of registered clinical trials included trials registered both in the U.S. and in China. Studies included up to March 7th. There are probably a few more since then. Of 353 studies identified, 115 were clinical trials of all different sorts of design. Open-label studies are not surprisingly the most frequent, follow at 46% of the 115 clinical trials now. There are 13% of these are double-blind and 10% are single-blind studies. Interestingly, the most frequently assessed therapies were stem Stem cell therapy. There are 23 ongoing trials for stem cells, 15 studies of lupinavir, ritonavir, 11 chloroquine studies, 7 hydroxychloroquine, 7 studies also in plasma treatments, 5 methylprednisolone studies, and 5 remdesivir studies. So we have results from obviously very few of those and eagerly await the results of many of these. The primary outcome in these is clinical in about 66% of studies. 23% of them are looking at viral loads and 8% are looking at radiological outcomes. So a lot of trials ongoing and we will keep you posted as we get new results from any of these. A bulletin from ENT UK is getting a lot of attention in the popular press. The British ENT surgeons have noted that loss of the sense of smell is a marker of COVID-19 infection in, in a significant number of cases. Uh, loss of your sense of smell, of course, is anosmia. They describe that post-viral anosmia is, of course, a leading cause of loss of sense of smell in adults, counting for up to 40% of cases of anosmia. It's well known that coronaviruses and, and any common cold virus can cause post-infectious loss of smell. Coronaviruses are thought to account for 10 to 15 percent of those cases. So it's not a surprise, they say, that COVID-19 would also cause anosmia. Interestingly, from South Korea, China, Italy, and Iran, lots of reports of COVID patients with anosmia or hyposmia. In Germany, in fact, it's reported that two in three confirmed COVID cases have anosmia. In South Korea, approximately 30 percent of patients testing positive have anosmia as a major presenting symptom in otherwise mild cases. Iran reporting the same thing. The British call themselves rhinologists, ENTs, say that this anosmia could be used potentially as a screening tool to help identify otherwise asymptomatic patients who then could be instructed to self-isolate. They also further note that corticosteroid use may increase the severity of COVID-19 infection, and so they would strongly advise against the use of oral steroids to treat new onset anosmia during this pandemic. Obviously, it's reasonable and easy to employ all possible personal protective equipment and measures when seeing a patient with anosmia during this pandemic. Unfortunately, the longest viability for both SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 one was on stainless steel and plastic. The median half-life for SARS-CoV-2 on stainless steel is 5.6 hours and 6.8 hours on plastic. Remember, these are half-lives. So while the amount of virus on these surfaces does go down dramatically, the virus can survive for up to 
three days possibly on these surfaces. The data for cardboard, they said, was noticeably quote unquote noisier than for other surfaces, but their estimate was that after about a day, there would be no remaining virus on cardboard. For healthcare professionals listening out there, of great interest is their discoveries. Healthcare clinicians listening will be most interested in the researchers aerosolized SARS-CoV-2 virus using a three-jet collision nebulizer fed into a Goldberg drum, which sounds like a coughing or sneezing machine, and found that the SARS-CoV-2 remained viable in those aerosols throughout the duration of their experiment, which was three hours. The authors conclude that aerosol and fomite transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is plausible since the virus can remain viable and infectious in aerosols for hours and on surfaces for up to days. This in part answers a question we have on Instagram from Mickey Portili who asks, do we know if this is spread more through droplets or airborne? So the answer, Mickey, is both. The virus lives in aerosolized cough sneezes and in droplets droplets that hit surfaces. Uh, depending on the nature of the surface, the virus will live up to days and certainly in the air can survive. We have a question from Ilsa Hale, who was the former EMM secretary. Ilsa asks, how long do you think social distancing and isolation will last? It's a great and important question as uh, President Trump today is calling for resumption of normal activities after Easter or around the time of Easter, which would be, I believe, April 12th this year. Virtually every public health expert out there says that this would be particularly dangerous in hard-hit areas. EMM's own Mason Tuttle asks, what is it like on the front lines of this pandemic? And I assure you that in days to come, we will have plenty of reportage from the front lines. Right now, at least in some Colorado hospitals, ER docs are reporting uh, lower than average volumes. It does appear that the public is getting the message to stay away from the ED for minor complaints. Finally, we have a question from Sonia on Instagram. Sonia asks, COVID-19 question from a severe asthmatic who's had lung infections the past two summers. If symptoms develop, is it safer to try to treat on your own or seek medical intervention right away? Sonia's question is, of course, one that many people will be asking in days to come. The CDC recommends that people who are mildly ill who suspect they have COVID stay home. Stay home, stay in touch with your doctor, and avoid public transportation. Don't use an Uber or a Lyft or a taxi. If you can, separate yourself from the other people in your home. This is known as home isolation, and that means isolating yourself from your pets as well. If you are feeling poorly and need to or feel like you need to visit your doctor, call ahead. Call your doctor's office. Call the emergency department. Tell them your symptoms. This will help the office protect themselves and other patients. If you're sick and you have a face mask, you should wear it. Cover your mouth and your nose with a tissue or with your elbow when you cough or sneeze. Immediately afterwards, wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. In fact, you should be cleaning your hands often. Washing hands with soap and water is ideal, especially after you blow your nose, cough, sneeze, go to the bathroom before and after eating or preparing food. If you don't have soap and water, use hand sanitizer. Use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol, covering all surfaces of your hands. Perhaps the greatest challenge for all of us is to avoid touching your eyes, nose, mouth, any part of your face really if you can with unwashed hands. To get back to Sonia's question though about when to seek medical attention, you really should be in touch with your physician. Certainly call your doctor's office before going in. Describe your symptoms. They'll tell you what to do. If you do go in to seek care, wear a face mask if you can and follow instructions from your health care provider and your local health department. Emergency warning signs for COVID include trouble breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, new confusion or an inability to arouse, and of course, bluish lips or face. You should still in this pandemic call 911 if you have a medical emergency. Certainly notify the operator that you have or you think you might have COVID-19. And if possible, put on that mask before help arrives. I've got to say that the emergency medical minute is not here to provide medical advice to anyone. And please don't don't misconstrue that CDC advice as a substitute for consulting your primary care physician. Thank you all for listening to this COVID weekly update from the EMM. We will be back soon with more COVID-related content. 